Let's welcome John. So the, um, the panels this morning were really good, and I think it gave us a really good perspective, especially from, uh, from an agency and a, and a client perspective in terms of what's on their mind and what's important. And I think it'll be a good, this, this talk will be a good transition as a media company, as a, as a people-based ad platform, part of a, a premium uh, uh, iconic brand company like Time Inc. to kind of say, as a media entity, what are we doing how are we working with our clients to improve measurement, to improve attribution, to make sure they're really getting uh, the value that they're looking for with their ad spend? So I'm going to really zero in on kind of three topics today. Um, I'm going I'm to talk about a people-based foundation and what that means and why that's important. I'm going to talk about cross-channel because, as you heard with uh, multi-touch attribution and, and everything here, it's, it's really, when you look at it from a pe through a people lens, it's holistic. It doesn't matter if I'm on my smartphone, my tablet, my laptop. If you're an influencer, if you're a target customer, that's who I want to talk to. Um, and then I'm going to get into a case study and talk a little bit about experimental design and what we're doing at Viant and how we're working with and, and trying to enable our, our clients to be more impactful with their ad spend. So if you look at identity and the evolution of identity, it's really interesting. I, I, I like this chart to kind of look at early days, you know, direct mail in the mailbox based on your home address, your phone number comes in, then email becomes prevalent and people are contacting you or communicating you through email, and then you have the rise of the internet. And, and what happened then is we went from pretty exacting um, identifiers to something that was a little more fuzzy and it, it, it turned into this cookie that was attached to this device that was a little bit less exacting than some of the earlier metrics and then we fast forward to today where we've got IP address, we've got device IDs, we've got all these different identifiers that tie back. Some of them tie back to machines, some of them tie back to households, some of them tie back to individuals. So you can see over the spectrum and how it's just layered on top and gotten even more complicated. But, but what's emerged the last couple years, and if you, if you follow the industry and you follow Facebook's quarterly earnings, is you see that this concept or idea of people-based advertising is really taking hold. And, and, and looking at and identifying real people and advertising and, and talking to real people. Uh, and it's, and it's, really, it's really emerged in a big way. So we use this illustration. This is our, this is Kate Anderson. She's our, uh, she's our favorite example uh, here. But if you look at it from a proxy perspective, and you look at, um, I guess it would be to your to your right side. Um, it used to be that it was we we think this person's 25 to 54, likely female. We think we know what DMA. Uh, that she lives in. We don't really know her email address. We don't really know that much about her devices. We know a little bit about our web traversal data because we can, we can follow and track that, but that's kind of the picture that we have. And then you, and then you look at it through a people-based lens. Now Kate, we know her name is Kate Anderson. She's 32 years old. She's female. She lives in Chicago. We have her email address. We know what devices she uses and tie that back to the household IP as well as her behaviors. But then you, you build that profile even more rich to say, okay, I don't just care about what she does online. I actually care about what she does offline. So she likes to subscribe to CRM lists, right? Maybe she's into couponing. Um, she buys Tropicana orange juice and Czech cereal, so we start to get into what brand she buys at the grocery store. She drives a Subaru Outback or she shops at Walgreens. So now you're starting to tie in and match back, not only know who she is, but then start to tie in all of the offline behavior to, to complete the picture. So when we talk about a people-based approach, that's what we mean. We mean holistically looking at um, that, that customer and all the attributes of that customer. So then we, then, then we kind of segue that into, okay, cross-channel. And there's been a lot of discussion today already about cross-channel, media mix modeling, and how, and how we manage that. Um, this is, from, uh, this is a, a chart that I, I borrowed from Nielsen looking at um, consumption, media consumption or video consumption, looking at Q1 of 2014 to Q1 of 2016. So really over a 24-month period, um, live TV, DVR, um, as well as streaming video. And streaming video is kind of all in, right? This is pr primarily driven, I'm sure, by mobile video consumption, but it's smartphones, it's computers, it's multimedia devices, game consoles, all in. And, and the biggest thing you'll notice is TV is still ex extremely significant, right? TV is not going away. 
the biggest screen in the house, very significant here, but it has slightly declined over that period of time. But where all the growth is, is in streaming video. And you see a total, the total hours obviously actually being more as well. And, and again, because that smartphone is with you, with you all the time. The, the challenge has been, and this has come up earlier, is how do you bring TV into the mix? You've got the biggest screen in the home, you've got a preponderance of time spent there, a lot of ad budget going there. How do we bring the TV into the measurement fold? How can we attribute that? If they saw an ad, did they go to the store? Did they purchase my product? Most uh, smart TVs sold after 2012 are actually um, have a technology in them called ACR, which is auto content recognition. And they're starting to be inroads now in using that as a better means beyond panels or beyond set-top boxes or, or the like to really get down to the household level and really understand the TV viewing habits. So it gets into programming and advertising that's coming through the cable box, OTT content, which wouldn't be captured by the cable box, but it's coming over the top, whether it's Netflix, Amazon Prime, et cetera, and then all the things that you would want to know, time of day, network, channel, program, duration, et cetera. So it, it creates a more robust uh, set of data, and it brings the TV into the measurement mix. This is an interesting uh, stat. This one's from Accenture. 82% um, of customers who switch brands say companies could have retained them with a more seamless cross-channel experience. And I think the most simple example when you think about cross-channel is maybe somebody purchasing online and then trying to return that item at the store, at the brick and mortar store, and having that inconsistency there. But it's, it's really incumbent on, on, on companies to, to break down those walls and really think about a seamless experience, whether that customer approaches you online, maybe they only research online and they buy in store, but you need to make that a very, a very seamless experience. So the goal here is a holistic view of the customer. So now here's Kate. We, we, we have her demographic information. We have her device graph and her profile. We know what she reads. She subscribes to People Magazine. She subscribes to Health. We know what she watches, where she shops, what she buys, what she drives. So this, again, getting beyond the proxy or the cookie or the model and getting into a much deeper and richer look at the customer, which is really going to help drive and I'll talk about it in a little bit, the ability to do attribution. And then at the end of the day, and I won't you know, talk a lot about this, but then technology brings it all together, right? This is all great in theory and concept. For us, it's, the, it's our platform, the Vine Advertising Cloud, where we store all the identity information, we execute the media, and we do the measurement. So um, again, I, this isn't about the technology side of it, but you know, that is really what brings it all together, whatever platform it is you're using, how you're, how you're able to connect the dots and bring it together. So that brings us to the challenges of attribution. And through our lens, it's really about real people, not proxies, and real people wherever they are or whatever device they happen to be on. These are some headlines around, you know, and these are, these are pretty recent. Dangerous question, does internet ad advertising work at all? We have a, no idea if online ads work. Um, you've got the old analogy, I know 50% of my marketing works, I just don't know which 50%. Um, and then this last one that talks about um, if you're not running a randomized controlled experiment, you probably don't know. Um, and that's something that we kind of took to heart. So, you know, earlier this year, our, our research team started working on this in conjunction with some of our clients and really starting to try to figure this out and, and do a better job on the measurement side. So in our mind, experimental design is the gold standard. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about what we do and how we do it, and I have a case study. So for Viant, causal, we call it causal attribution. We look at things like impact of in-store sales, online sales. We've done a lot with TV tune-in, uh, as well as brand lift um, and, and, and brand resonance in terms of how we look at it. So how does it work? So every ad call runs through a randomizing um, algorithm on IP address. Again, we start everything at the household level with the household IP and the devices are, are connected to that household. An algorithm assigns the IP to tester control. So we're not, we're not creating a modeled group or anything like that. We're, we're, we're doing, we're doing an, an assignment vis-a-vis -vis an algorithm. 
Targeting for test and control segments is identical. We're not treating them differently because, again, we want a true view of how is the campaign truly impacting. And then lift, you know, test minus control divided by control, so how, how we measure lift. So the, so the example that I have um, is a casual dining restaurant. We've, we've run a few of these throughout the course of the year, but the one I wanted to show, because there's a few different dimensions here. So kind of two, two things, more customers and more spend by the customers that, that, that arrive, right? So I want, I want more customers coming through my door and the customers that come, I want, them, I want a bigger check, I want them spending more. So on the, on the more customer side, we had a 16% uh, increase in, in likelihood to dine in that restaurant. And, and for the check, we had a $3 increase uh, in, in the check. Now casual dining, obviously, we're not talking about high end here in terms of the size of the check. All in, the return on ad spend was $1.37, and based on the size and scale of the campaign, that was almost a half million dollars in incremental revenue. So, and then we said, okay, that's great, and we've all seen a lot of studies like this. You know, I don't, you don't see a lot that don't work, right? Is, is the lift, is this really a true uh, testing control? So we go back, because we are a people-based platform, and we check ourselves. And we say, okay, let's look at the makeup of the two groups after the fact and how did we do? So we just pulled out a few attributes here. If you look at it from a, uh, from a gender uh, perspective, you can see female, male, and the breakout and how close we are from a test versus control. Ethnicity, white, African-American, Hispanic, and, and of course age. So when you look at that, you get a pretty good sense that those two groups are very representative. They were, they were exposed to the same targeting criteria and that we've got a, a more of a true measurement uh, of ad impact. So I guess in, in summary and wrapping up, again looking at it from as a media company and kind of partnering with our clients and how can we make this better, a people-based foundation we feel is critical. You have to take a cross-channel approach. Segmenting, it, it makes it very difficult to, to measure the true impact and, and you need some type of experimental design and you need to validate that and make sure it's working on behalf of the client. And with that, I have about two and a half minutes if there's any questions. Yeah. Uh, what's the source of your ACR data? Uh, we, wor we work with manufacturers directly. So Smart Teeth start, to, I, uh, yeah, I, I can't necessarily expose that here on stage in front of a big group. But yeah, we work with a variety of Smart TV manufacturers. <laughs> Uh, Any actually, other questions? Yeah, yeah, I had a question. Uh, I was I was looking for, I was similar to the question she's asking what data, but how do you handle uh, the client's ability to tag and or know the different ads, et cetera? Do you actually provide that kind of service or do you go off of what they have? How do you Yeah, so we, we don't sell television, but we work with clients that obviously have campaigns that include TV. So what we'll do is we'll fingerprint the commercials and then we'll capture those when they're, when they're, so when they're shown through the ACR data, we'll capture that, that, that commercial. We can't tell if the person's sleeping on the couch, but, but we know that the, the commercial was rendered you know, on the screen and the TV was on. Yeah. Am I getting the, getting the boot? Subtle. <laughs> Hi, uh, Mike Hess with U.S. International Media. I heard somebody in the hallway a minute ago saying, let's inject more controversy into the meeting. So I don't know if this question's controversial, but could you talk more about causality? Like, I think this is one of the first times, frankly, I've ever heard the word causal as opposed to correlational injected into an attribution discussion. So I'm excited by that, but talk more why you know, the why and wherefore of causality and how strongly you feel that this stuff is really causal the way you're doing it. I think that's a fantastic question and because I'm getting the hook and I also have my head of research and analytics here and we're going into a break, I will invite you to come down front and we can, we can talk about that. All right, thank you very much, I appreciate it. <laughs>